Good morning. It's January 17th, uh, Sunday, January 17th, and this is my Sunday school lesson. So uh, thank you for liking it, those people who just tuned in because they saw my name, and bye, because I know I don't want to hear no Sunday school lesson. But thank you for the rest of you. <laughs> um, we, we are in the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis chapter 22. And we're probably in one of the two most famous scriptures in the Bible, two most famous chapters uh, in Genesis, which is when Abraham is sent to sacrifice his son. This is a fascinating chapter. Uh, it's the culmination of what God has been teaching Abraham. So this does not come out of the blue, you may feel that way, but uh, it's this like Abraham's final exam. Uh, and so, because after this, you don't hear much about Abraham any longer. Um, the question is, does he pass the test? Does he not pass the test? Well, I, I guess you kind of know what happens. So, um, let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. It says, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. This is an interesting translation. Um, the word tempt should better have been translated prove. Literally in the Hebrew, God proved Abraham. And that's, that's very important because we have this weird thing with the word tempt and what it means. So it says, God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, behold, here I am. Like, what's up? Okay. So uh, it says, God did tempt Abraham. And yet in James chapter 1, verse 13, it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Because God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So it says, God tempted Abraham, and then it says, don't say God tempted me. Okay, so uh, here's what James is talking about. God doesn't tempt us to do evil. Uh, so God, and and... Uh, so James is saying, if, when you mess up, don't say, God made me mess up. God doesn't bring the trial so that you will mess up. That's what the devil does. But um, he does test us. He does prove us. And I really like the Hebrew translation when it says, God proved him. Um, and your good teachers are proving what you've learned to you. Here, I'm gonna show you how much you've learned. The bad teachers <laughs> are taking this opportunity to flunk out all the people who they don't like. No. But but uh, that's what the test is supposed to be. Let me prove to you how much you've been learning so that you'll know and that we'll, I'll know. Of course, God already knows. That's why he's proving to us so that we can go, oh, that's where I'm at, right? But when we fail the test, this is what James is talking about, and the, you fail the test by choosing the wrong answer. I'm all stressed, so I'm going to go get drunk. Well, God brought the test that was stressing you, but there was other alternatives. Don't say that when you got decided to go hit somebody or go gamble, whatever the negative thing is that you're doing in response to the stress. He says, don't say God made you do that. God brought the test in the trial. But there was a bunch of right answers. There's like A, B, C, D, and E. Any of the above you could have chosen. But you chose E, none of the above, and you chose to do a negative thing in response to the trial you were going through. Proving that you must, you must not have learned much, right? Okay, so... Uh, so the trial is there. Uh, God brings a test. And, and if, if I'm a teacher, I've been teaching uh, medicine, and I'm training doctors. Well, before I can graduate them and say, yes, go out. You're a doctor. We've got to see how much you know. Do you know yet how to do this? You know how to, So we, you, and we want the doctors to go through tests. We, they'll bring in a cadaver and, okay, now I've been showing you all week how to operate over the past month. So now let's see how much you know. Again, your teacher doesn't know. You don't know. So you're proving how much you know. God does know, though. 
So he's showing us, he's showing us where we're at, right? But he always has a goal for us. He had a goal for Abraham. He has a goal for us because he knows how he's going to use you. So the goal for at medical school is for you to be a doctor and be able to go out and treat people. So they, you know what the goal is and they know the different milestones you have to pass. If you're going to be a lawyer, whatever we're going to be, we know what the goal is. For us, God has a goal for us. There's people we're going to reach. There's lives we're going to touch. And so he, he gives us various tests along the way so we can see where we're at on our way to that goal. Okay. Um, in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4 says, then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now, he says, I'm going to rain down manna, and I've told each person how much to get. And I'm going to test you to see, are you going to do that? Are you going to gain extra? Will you trust that if I give you this, you know how the Bible says, give us this day our daily bread? Give me what I need for today. Are you going to trust that I gave you what you need for today? Or are you going to say, oh, I better get this extra? Are you going to hoard that toilet tissue? Are you going to go in and grab all the Lysol off the shelf because you're afraid that the store is going to blow up? Uh, are you going to, so you're going to, are we going to get what we're supposed to get just today? Or are we just not, not going to trust him and say, no, I better get, because God may be asleep tomorrow. And that's, that he, again, so that's what he's trying to see. How much do you trust me? Because I'm going to provide you tomorrow and I'm going to provide the next day. Will you trust that? So uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 and 3, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way those 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you. Those two things he was doing in Deuteronomy 8, 2 and 3. This is at the end of the 40 years. He's saying, I needed to humble you because you absolutely would not listen to me. You absolutely kept doing your own thing and said, you saw me on the mountain thundering and lightning, and yet you built an idol because you said, I'm going, I, God doesn't know what he's doing. He brought us out here to kill us. And sometimes we think God doesn't know what he's doing. We think, Lord, you forgot about my bank account or you forgot about that job I was trying to get or you forgot my sister was ill. Hello, I've been God for like a long time. <laughs> so, but we think God doesn't know what he's doing. That's why we panic, right? And so we think we know better than God how things should go, how they should end up, what should happen. We know better. God, you should have done this. You should have done that. If, if you were going to really come through, you would have done this by now. So God says, I had to humble you so that you realize you don't know nothing. I know everything. Why would you trust yourself? When I'm the one who created you, I create it tomorrow. So why would you, why wouldn't you listen to me? I've already been a hundred years from now. I already know everything that's going to happen. I got this. But they didn't think God had this. And we don't think God has it. We don't think he does. It's like, that's why we panic. That's why we stress out. We have to tell ourselves, okay, God has been here. God already knows. God already has the answers. He, he's good. God has got this. We have to just keep telling ourselves that because it's us panicking right and then we choose a bad thing that's what james say when you choose a bad answer uh don't say god made you do that because god's been teaching us all along how he will come through and then he sends that test to prove us and to see do we really believe he's going to come through or not okay so he says i sent you in the wilderness to humble and to test you that's deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2 to know what was in your heart now, does God not know what's in our heart? No, so that we'll know what's in our heart. To test us so that we can know what's in our heart. So we can go, wow, that happened and I got really crazy. That I must not, I still must not trust God because look how I responded. Look how angry I got or nervous I got or stressed I got. Or the, so I still must not trust that God's got this. I really think that God's just holding on. We have an image of God trying to get his will done. And that's taught a lot today in Christian circles like, God's like knocking on the door, trying to get his will done, but do it as opposed to, no, God's in charge. God's in charge. He's got this. And if we knew that God, if we worshiped a God that was in charge, we could relax more. So to know that what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not, here's Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and led you with manna, which you did not know. So I put you, he put us in a position where we'd be hungry and then he fed us. That's what he's telling 
So I, 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 I took you away from the normal sources of food that you were used to in Egypt. And then I fed you, right? So I, I let you be, go hungry so that then you had, were forced now to trust me. And God will do that sometimes. He'll drop certain resources so that we go, okay, God, I got to trust in you. And God's like, you should have been trusting in me all along. But that's really how we think. Well, I'm, we know we just got to trust in God now. And God's like, hello, why were you trusting in me yesterday? So that's our fault. So he'll put us in a situation where, okay, now we have to trust in God. But if we were just trusting him every day, we wouldn't find ourselves in these situations. Or when we get to those situations, we get an A because we've been trusting him all along. So, okay, this came up. I'm good. I know God's going to come through. That's where he wants us to get to, where when something happens, we can just praise him. We're singing. We're giggling in the hospital because we know God's going to come through. God's got this. Okay. So. Uh, he says, uh, he humbled you, allowed you to hunger. He fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So you're focused on the food instead of being focused on what I'm telling you to do. If you just focus on what I'm telling you to do that day, you'll find the manna. Uh, and sometimes we think, well, I know God's saying to do that, but I better take care of this business over here first. I need to be practical. And God's like, no, take care of my business first. And then if you do that, you'll, you'll discover that I've provided for you. It's like, oh, I can't give this to the church. I can't put this money in the church. I got to save this money for groceries next week. I know God wants a tenth of mine. But and God's like, if you go ahead and do what I told you to do, then you'll see that I've provided, right? So man doesn't live by bread, meaning man doesn't focus on bread. He focuses on God's word. And then he finds his needs met. So that's why this is the purpose of the test. And we're just talking about Abraham and God says, God tested Abraham. Here's what's the purpose of the test. So God is teaching us all the time, teaching, 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 teaching. And then once he sees that we've got something, he'll put us through a test to prove us and go, oh, look, so you got that now. That's an area where you trust me. The devil She's our weaknesses. He comes to us and then gets us to make those bad decisions. Uh, because, well, you know, and that's the devil. So we've got the, a couple of different voices in our head. God's saying, it's all going to be all right. And the devil says, it's not going to be all right. All right. So uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. So that's what we need to understand. Whatever we're going through, a lot of people are going through this. The devil says, this has never happened before. This thing that's happening to you, this is crazy. No, the, so what are you going to do? Because no one ever did. And he's like, no, no, no. People go through this all the time. It's okay. And have survived for years. So it's common to man. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tested beyond what you're able to. So, so God knows what you can bear, right? He got, he knows, he knows where we're at. So if I'm teaching first grade math, I don't necessarily give them calculus because I know they can't handle that. So let me just test their addition skills. You know, God, that whatever we're going through, God knows he has equipped us. He has equipped us to survive it. We just have to trust that what he's taught us will work. Right. So he doesn't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation, he also makes the way of escape. He, he gives you the right answer. So we're not, you know, on that multiple choice test. A, B, he, 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 he gives us the, the way to handle it. Right. That you may be able to bear it. So we he, hear the choices. We know what to do. OK, I'm just going to start praising God. We, I hear people, you know, we say this all the time. So I just started praying. Or, you know what, I went to the beach, I said, I'm not going to stress about this, I'm not going to worry, right? We, he, we know what to do, but will we choose A or are we going to choose E, none of the above, right? So, uh, in James chapter 1, verse 14, going back to what James had said earlier about no one, don't say God tempted you, he means God tempted you to do evil. He says, each one is tempted and he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So, it's your it's, if you choose E instead of A or B or C, you know, to choose none of the above and you're going to do something stupid. That's that's you. God didn't make you make that choice. God has shown us how to react in certain situations. He's shown us 
what to do. We know how to praise him or pray or stay calm or call up a friend and say, Lord, pray for me, you know, but when we choose that wrong way to, don't say God made you do that, but he did bring the test, but we chose E instead of A, B, C, D, or right, right. So then that's because that's our own problem. That's not God doing that. James 1, 2, he says, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into various t tests. Really? Yeah. You suppose when, when I remember, um, with a friend of mine because he points this out to me because uh, he was a new christian and and we were driving in my car which was a mistake and uh we ran out of gas did i run out of gas or have a flat tire it could have been either because that was my life right so we ran out of I, we just ran out of gas inside the road and he tells me the first thing i can't wait to see what god does because we were somewhere like where no one was gonna drive by. There was no phone booth. There was no cell phones at the time. This was in the seventies, uh, eighties, early eighties. And, but I said, well, God's gonna do something. I mean, I knew, and he tell, he says that he, that struck him. Cause when he's been in situations, people have run out of gas. The first thing they've done is they've cussed and what's going, you know, but I, but I said, cause I said, well, God's going to come through because he always does. So somebody's going to drive by or something's going to happen, which is exactly what happened. Someone drove by and pulled over and said, Oh, I saw your car by the side of the road. And then, yeah, but I, but God's going to come through in those situations. I couldn't do anything. So I said, Oh, well, I can't wait to see how God fixes this. Cause that's how I knew him, a God who fixes things. That's how I've been taught by my parents, by my mom, by my dad, right? He's the God who fixes things. So it says, count it all joy when you when a test comes, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And see, patience is what brings the promises. He wants us to be, when, when things start to happen, instead of panicking, we wait to see God's deliverance. We're waiting to see, and patience is the thing, is that vehicle that brings the, the, the answer to us. When we're not patient and we start to solve it in our own way, like Abraham did with Ishmael, that was his solution. You end up with an Ishmael in your life and you're, oh, what am I going to do? Right? But when we wait for God's deliverance, that's what patience brings. In fact, Hebrews 6, 12 says, uh, when the, the author of Hebrews, which we think, well, it doesn't matter who I think it is, but the author of Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12 He's telling them, hey, I know you're going through a big trial, but just calm down. He says, I pray that you do not become lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. That's how we, those are the two things. That's how we get the promise. We, we believe, faith is believing what God has spoken to us. And through patience, we patiently wait for it. We don't just freak out. So Abraham, getting back to, <laughs> Abraham's been sent, right? And God's testing Abraham. And he has to just wait. I know God's going to do something. So here's what God said. Now, just back, so that was all Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. God says God was proving Abraham. Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Which is so interesting because you know Abraham had two sons. And an adopted son by Eliezer. But when he says thine only son, he's meaning the only son of the promise. So this particular son, I've had a set of promises and I'm gonna see if you believe them or not. So this is the only son that I've made these particular set of promises about. And the things that God has put in our lives, the things that he's put in our lives, that is part of a promise to us, the car he gave us or the job or the spouse or whatever that the, the neighbors that he's put, whatever he's given us, the assignment he's given us, uh, he's gonna test us on that to see, do we believe what he said about it? And the other test, the purpose of this test was, be, well, when God gives us something, we've gotta understand who owns it. We think that we own it but God still owns it. It's still his. House? And see, God's house. <laughs> God's house. So, so uh, we take ownership of it and we start deciding how it should go and how, when it should happen and where. And, and God's like, no, 
I still own that. You think you own it, but it's still mine. It's still his church. It's still his everything. But we like to take ownership and stuff. This is my church. And that then we start making decisions about it. This is my this. This is my that. And God will put us in a position where we have to let go of it to recognize that he has it. It's his. And that way we'll listen to what he says to do with it. Right? So that's the test that's coming up. We're going to get to that in a second. Maybe. So he said, now take now thy son, thy only son, I mean the son that I told, gave you, that's the one that you came up with, mm -hmm. whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering up on one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So I want you to go to Moriah. In the land of Moriah is this region. Moriah had several hills, um, not mountains like Mount Everest that were real high, but hills like Baldwin Hills, like Beverly Hills, like different hills. There's a, there's a series of hills um, in Moriah. And so it's not just one mountain. And in fact, he says, um, when you offer him up, I want you to offer him up, like give him up as a, uh, as a burnt offering, as though that's what's going to happen on one of the mountains, which I'll tell you, what, I'll tell you which of those four or five mountains it is I specifically want you to put them up. Now there was a reason that God was gonna show him a specific mountain. So here's what happened on the particular mountain that Abra God was picking, showed Abraham. God was picking this specific mountain for a reason of what was gonna happen there later. So in Second Chronicles chapter three, verse one, it says, now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. On, on, now, again, there's more than one mountain. There's a specific mountain at Mount Moriah. So Solomon is building the temple on this particular mountain where they're going to do sacrifices, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Omen, the Jebusite. So earlier, um, David, Solomon's father, had purchased this particular mountain. So you have to picture mountains that have a, a plateau and then another mountain that has a plateau so that you can build on it. So on one of these mountain tops, these hilltops, it was flat. And David earlier had purchased it from on Omen, the Jebusite. And that's where God was building his temple through Solomon. And we, it's possible that this is the same place that God led Abraham to, to sacrifice his son, and that sacrifices were going to be done later. But I, we need to look at uh, what David did and why, what was going on there, and how David got this particular land. Because this the same place that they, Abraham sacrificing um, Isaac is the place where the temple was being built years later. So here's how David got it. In First Chronicles chapter 21, Verse one through four it says, "Now Satan, Satan stood up against Israel. Israel, Israel, help me, help me, help me. Yeah. Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Now, so here's the problem because this, and this is the first time they've called Satan by name in the whole Old Testament. Interestingly enough, this is the first time they say, now Satan did this. But they were clear that he was showing his behind, that Satan showed up, and that he moved David to number Israel." Uh, David wasn't supposed to count how many people because counting how many people was he was doing that because for military purposes and for pride purposes. How many people do we have here? How many people? And God never he wanted him to worry about that because the Bible says God can save by many or by few. So if, if God was going to send David out into battle, he didn't want him to trust in the numbers of people. Oh, good. Well, we got a thousand people we can win. Because God's like, if you got two people, you can win. If you got one, if you just got me, you can win. Don't don't you don't you start focusing on how many people there are because then you think, well, that's going to be they, they do this in okay, so we should get this amount of money in. Well, God can you can have one person and God can give you the amount of money you need for your church to sustain for that week. We we get caught up in the numbers, and God doesn't want us to do that. It's not how many people are there. It's how many how how is god there or not that's the question and so it was a sin for david to start numbering and start worrying about how many people were there and and god warned him not to do that so verse 2 in first chronicles 21 verse 2 so david said to joab and to the leaders of the people go number israel from beersheba to dan remember beersheba we saw last week that's where abraham made that uh oath with um 
Abimelech. So it's that southern Jerusalem. That's the southernmost part of Jerusalem. Today, where, Pal where the Palestinians live today. So go from Beersheba all the way north to Dan. Dan was the northernmost tribe in Israel, right? And bring the number of them to me that I may know it. I need to know how many people are here in case we get attacked again. And God's like, no, you don't. So Joab answered and said, may the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. I mean, God can increase it. It doesn't matter how many people there. God can increase it a hundred times. But my Lord, the king, are not they all my Lord's servants? They're not yours. They don't belong to you. They're God. It doesn't matter. I hope there's a hundred times more than, but, they're, but they belong to God. You don't need to number and know how many people there are. Just know that God's going to come through. Why then does my Lord require this thing? And it's about ownership again. They're the Lord's. So why do you care how many people they are? They all belong to God and he's going to move on them, right? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel, make people feel bad or nervous? Oh, man, there's only this many of us and there's only that many of us and the other, they're going to attack us. Plus, here's the bigger problem. We tend to pick up the habits of our leaders. If our leader says, hey, we're all going to go to war. Then we go, yeah, we should go to war. If our leader says, those people are bad, you should attack them. We tend to think, oh, he's right. We should go attack. There, that's the enemy. Now, God may have a different enemy. But we are, our leaders, we tend to take on their guilt because whatever they say, we need to raise taxes. We need to cut taxes. We need to do this. We need to do that. And then the, our leader's followers take on that same mindset. Right. Whatever our leaders are saying, that's why God didn't want Israel to have a king in the first place. Because whatever they do, whatever crazy thing they do or wonderful thing they do for good or bad, you're going to start to think just like them. And then you're going to be guilty of their sin. So he says, why then my Lord require this? Why should he be cause of guilt in Israel? You're going to make Israel guilty, too, because then they're going to want to know how many people there are. And they're going to start to worry about how many people there are. And they're going to take on your sin. So that's why our leaders have to be very careful. It's important who our leaders are because we tend to start to think like them. Okay. Nevertheless, the kings were prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. So even though David was warned, he's go he went all throughout Israel. And now they're all worried about how many they are. And none of them are any longer trusting God. All of them are now guilty of David's sin. So verse seven, and God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he struck Israel because they're, all guilty now. Verse 9, then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer. So God had set a prophet in David's uh, kingdom, right? And and uh, it's a saying, go tell David, saying, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things, because now I'm about to punish you. Choice A, B, or C. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. And he says, either I'm going to have um, three years of famine as punishment, since all of Israel no longer trust me, you, it's your fault. You made all of Israel worried about how many people they are and ha, instead of trusting that it doesn't matter. So three years of famine is punishment or three months of being attacked by your enemies or three days of my vengeance coming on you. So three years, three months, three days. Now, I would rather be attacked by my enemies than have God. <laughs> but, but David said, well, let me go with God for three days because he'll be merciful where my enemies won't be merciful. So David chose that, right? So I'll take the three days of God coming at everybody. Okay. So verse 14. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel and 70,000 men of Israel fell. This is in the first day. <laughs> And God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. Like, okay, for three days, I'm just going to start destroying everybody. And as he was destroying it, the Lord looked and relented of the disaster. So David actually chose right because then God is merciful. His mercy kicked in. So even though they deserve judgment, mercy means we don't get what we deserved. So it's not like God was unjust for judging them, for all of them turning their backs on God and saying it's more important how many that we are than that God is protecting us. But his mercy kicked in. And so his judgment stopped, right? So he relented of disaster and said to the angel who was destroying, it is enough, now restrain your hand. So after 70,000 people, God said, okay, they get it, right? And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. Now this threshing floor is on Mount Moriah, okay? On one of the mountains of Mount Moriah. So there's, there's three or four, right? There's four or five mountains. And that's where the temple was built. Okay, so Onan the Jebusite, owned one of those mountaintops 
and the angel of the Lord stops there. And he's hovering there. The angel of the Lord's hovering there. So verse 16 says, then David lifted his eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven. Now, Mount, those, these, these mountaintops are in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a big place. Like Los Angeles is a big place. Beverly Hills is one section of it. Baldwin Hills is one section of it. So he looks over, David's in Jerusalem, and he can see the angel of the Lord hovering above those particular hills on the very outskirts of Jerusalem. The, the temple was built like right on the edge of Jerusalem, okay? So he sees the, the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven and having in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. So he's on those mountains. He's right above Omens, the Jebusite's threshing floor where he built a threshing floor there, right? And, and we're going to talk about that in a second, what that meant. And he says, uh, so David and the elders clothed in sackcloth and ashes, they fell on their faces. So they oh no, there's the angel. So God's showing him actually who's doing it, who's bringing the plague. Right. So now he says, go to Onan the Jebusite. So he sends them on their way. And then verse 18, it says, therefore, the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go and erect an altar of the Lord on the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. So he's sending him to that mountain. Same range where God sent Abraham to sacrifice, to build that altar. So apparently a lot of, this was a place that in general, they had erected a lot of altars. When God sent Abraham there, this was a mountaintop. They, they liked going to mountaintops to building altars to God, because I guess they thought they were closer to God if they got higher up. Now, we don't think that today. We don't build churches necessarily in hills thinking, oh, I'm closer to God. But we do think we have to be in the church to be closer to God. So if you close the church, how can God hear my prayer? I'm not at church. We don't think God's in our homes. We don't think God's at the store. If you don't, if you don't let me in that church, then uh, God won't hit. Well, psh. so we're just as crazy as they are. Okay, we don't have God's everywhere. Um, but so He sends them to the threshing floor that's built on top of one of the mountain Moriah's mountains. Okay, so. Um, and he says, go there and make an altar. Same place, same general area where Abraham had been sent. Now, Onan turned and he saw the angel. So Onan's there threshing. So let's go over the th what happens when you're threshing. There's two, there's two things that happen on the threshing floor. Uh, the ox go by and they smash everything. They smash, you, you take the grain, you just, you've taken your winning wing fork and you've cut it, right? And the grain's on the ground, and then the ox come by, and they take the little threshing materials, all the wood, and they smash, and they separate the grain from the stalk. And then you take the wind and wing fork that you use to cut everything down, and you toss it in the air, and the wind blows and separates the wheat from the chaff. The chaff is that last little covering that's over the grain, right? And that it blows off, and then the, everything that's good falls to the floor, and everything that's bad gets blown away. Now, it says, Onan turned, and he saw the angel... And his four sons who were with him, they hid themselves. But Onan continued threshing the wheat. He says, I know that angel's there, but I got something to do. So as long as he's not doing nothing mess with me, I need to get this wheat done. <laughs> Verse 21, so David came to Omen, and Omen looked and saw David. And he, Now, when he saw David, that's when he got excited. And he went out from the threshing floor, and he bowed before David with his face to the ground. So the king is here. The angel's there hovering. That doesn't impress me. But the king is here. Let me go talk to him. Then, verse 22, then David said to Omen, grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar on it to the Lord. You shall grant it to me at the full price that the plague may be withdrawn from the people because this is how the plague is going to be stopped. This is how the curse is going to be stopped. Jesus became a curse for us so that we can see the blessings. So we can't receive the blessing until this curse is stopped and the curse will be stopped if I can build an altar here on this threshing floor. So this is David, and the, we know the son of David. Okay, so we need to see the parallels here, obviously, right? But Omen said to David, take it to yourself. Just take it and let my Lord the king do what is good as an eye. Look, I also give you, I'll give you the offering for the burnt offerings because you're going to need to burn when you have your offering, you need to burn some ox on it. I'll give you the threshing in instruments for wood. So the wood that they were using, to, you, uh, you can take the wood and the wheat, for the grain offering, you, I'm just going to give it to you. Then King David said to Omen, no, but I will surely buy it for the full price, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings, which cost me nothing. So there, you haven't made a sacrifice if it costs you nothing. Sometimes God wants us to sacrifice. He's telling Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your only son. I want you to let go of something that's dear to you. 
And and so he says, I it's not a sacrifice if it didn't cost me anything. So we've got to think about that because um, I've got a hundred dollars and I want to give my tithe ten percent of it to the Lord, and the other nine He's got to last me the week, and that's a sacrifice. Okay, let me give this ten dollars to the Lord, and then somebody comes along and gives you a hundred dollars, and you say, Oh, well now I can give that ten dollars to the Lord. <laughs> well, no, maybe you should give the whole hundred. <laughs> you know that because it's not uh, it's not a sacrifice if it didn't cost you anything. God, there's, there because there's a principle there where we're trusting, where we're trusting. If I let go of this. If I can let go of this, then God's going to bless me. But it has to be something that costs us something, right? It has to be something where you're truly making a sacrifice. You're, Abraham, I want you to give your only son. I want you to give your only begotten son. It's got to cost you something. And then God will bless you. So uh, if you want to stop the curse, then th there must be a sacrifice. And then the blessing will come. God will repay, right? So I'm not going to take this from you, Omen, unless it's, cost me something then david said to omen oh no but obviously buy it okay that's we are he said it verse 26 so david built there an altar to the lord and he offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the lord and he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of burnt offering he said yes he came down and he burnt up everything as a way of saying, yes, I received this offering. The curse has stopped. So the curse that was coming on the people is being stopped because of this offering that you sacrificed here on top of Mount Moriah. Again, his threshing floor was built on Mount Moriah. So in 2 Chronicles verse 3, going back to that, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, going back to that, now Solomon built the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. On Mount Moriah. So this place where David sacrificed, this area where Abraham sacrificed his only begotten son. Well, not his only begotten son. I'm making that up. His only son of the promise. This same place where David sacrificed, God instructed Solomon to build a temple and they were to bring their sacrifices there to atone for their sins. The sacrifice was representative, right, of this atoning that was going to come at that same spot. We'll learn later that Calvary is also Golgotha. Golgotha is also one of those mountain ranges on Mount Moriah. So Golgotha, where Jesus was sacrificed, was that was a hill that was right outside of the temple. It was the next hill, the highest hill up. So this whole mountain range where God sent Abraham is the place where the temple was ultimately going to be built, where sacrifices were made. And it was the same place near where Abraham sacrificed his son. It's where God sacrificed his son. So but we'll get to that then as, as we're just only in Genesis 2 chapter verse 3. We're only in verse 3. So uh, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place where God had prepared the threshing floor. Okay, let's see if I've got time to do this quickly. So there are seven people in the Bible who God named before they were born. I mentioned this weeks ago, months ago. There are seven people. Isaac was one of them. Uh, and there's interesting connection between them and the temple. So there's seven people that God announced what their name was going to be before they were born. Seven people in the Bible. Okay. The first is Isaac. It's about 1900 BC, by the way. 1900 BC is when Isaac was born, around that time period. He was offered up at the site of where the temple was ultimately going to be built. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 19, God said, No, Sarah. No, he didn't say no, Sarah. He says, no, Abraham, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you should call his name Isaac, which means God's laughing, he who laughs, because I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. So Isaac was sacrificed at the place where the temple was to be built. Solomon was the one who built the temple. His birth was announced in 1 Chronicles 22, verse 9. Bible says, Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies all around, and his name shall be Solomon, for I will give peace and quietness to Israel in his days, and he shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I shall be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. So Isaac, who was named before, was sacrificed at the place where the temple was built. Solomon was one who actually built the temple. Josiah was in, in 650 BC, so we're heading toward Jesus. Um, Solomon was born around 900. 
Isaac was born about 1900. So in 650 BC, Josiah is born. Uh, it's in, in 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 2. It says, Behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So Jeroboam is one of the kings. He's the king in Israel, in northern Israel. Jeroboam is the king, and he's wicked, okay? And the man of the Lord shows up. They don't say who it was. He shows up and says, Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you, talking about this altar, he shall sacrifice the priest of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. And sure enough, Josiah did that. Part one of what Josiah did when he had an awakening, when he was born, uh, this is around, he's he's in the, oh, I'm sorry, this, this, this prophecy happened in the 700s, and Josiah was born in the 600s, about 100 years later. Okay, so um, he sacrificed the men, the priest of Baal on that altar in the north because God had only want one altar to be built. He only wanted the altar to be built in Jerusalem on this particular site. It was very important that God focus people's attention because something, see how I have you sacrificing all the time on Mount Moriah right here at this place because something's going to happen at this place and I want you to recognize it when it happens. So when I come through and you see my my son sacrifice, you go, oh, this must be God. So this is God like using 2,000 years of history to help teach Israel. This sacrificing at Jerusalem is important. So when Jesus were to come, they have no excuse. Well, we didn't know somebody was going to be sacrificed at right at that spot. Yes, you did. God's been telling you for 2,000 years. So when Jeroboam is, built his own temple up in north, and had the priest of Baal sacrificing there, Josiah, who was born 100 years later, he took all the priests of Baal and killed them and sacrificed them on that same altar. And then he even dug up the bones of dead priests who had sacrificed to Baal and burned their bones on the altar. Like, I want you all the way gone. Mm. And then he put them in individual sacks. No, I'm just kidding. Ah. And so, so he burnt them all, like all the worshipers of Baal, I'm even digging up your bones and burning them, right? So then he had his own personal awakening, awakening, and he was the only good king after Solomon and David who uh, restored the temple and brought it back to life and restored worship in the temple. And, and um, it, like in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 1 through 2, now the king sent them, this Josiah, to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah, and with him, all that happened in Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. And he said, this is what we need to do. We need to be worshiping. So Josiah restored worship in the temple and he rebuilt the temple and he, he fixed. So they all had something to do with the temple, right? The fourth person, because there's seven people who are God predicted their birth before they were born and named them before they were born, right? Uh, uh, Cyrus, he's another person who ordered the temple rebuilt. So Josiah restored worship in the temple, but Cyrus actually rebuilt the temple after it had been destroyed. After Josiah, right, after Josiah said, you better change your ways and we need to worship, they didn't. And so God destroyed the temple. So Cyrus is the one who rebuilt it. His birth is, pre is predicted in Isaiah um, 45, verse 1 and then verse 4. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, now Cyrus is born like 150 years later, whose right hand I have strengthened to subdue nations before him, to loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. For Jacob, my servant's sake, this is verse four, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. So I'm naming you before you're even born and you don't even know who I am. You're like the king of a whole other country, but you're going to come and rebuild my temple. Fifth person, John the Baptist. His, his, his birth is predicted before he's born. Okay, what did he have to do with the temple? In Luke chapter 1, verse 8, it says, So it was that while Zechariah is serving as priest before God in the order of his division. So there were so many priests at this time. So Aaron had had a baby and then his babies had babies and those babies had babies baby so uh, by a thousand 
10 years later, by the time it gets to Zechariah, there were so many priests that descended directly from Aaron that they, they might have to take turns. You would draw a lot. And it was actually Zechariah. And you could live for 90 years when it finally became your turn because there were so many priests. So it was finally Zechariah's turn to go into the temple. When he gets in the temple, there's an ha. Ah, okay. So he kind of he might have been upset. Man, it's taking so long. But God knows when your number's coming up, and he'll have an angel waiting for you. It's okay. So so there's an angel sitting in there in the temple, and the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, even though you thought you'd be here by yourself, and I'm here. So calm down, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you should call his name John. So before John is born, he hears his name in the temple being proclaimed right no john didn't hear his name but zacharias was told who who what the name is baby here's what john says uh when he's baptizing john the baptist in luke 3 verse 16 through 17 john answered saying to all i indeed baptize with water because what does he have to do with the temple but one mightier than i is coming whose sandal strap i'm not even worth to loose he will baptize you with the holy spirit and fire his winnowing fan fork is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and he's referring back to the threshing floor in the temple because remember it used to be a threshing floor before it was a temple and you take the fork and you cut down the wheat and then you separate the wheat from the shaft with that winnowing fork so he's saying there's one coming and his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor in the temple and jesus did jesus went in the temple and he cleared out his threat separating the wheat from the chaff, and you Pharisees, you're going to hell, and you, the, right? And he will gather the wheat into his barn, and the shaft he will burn with an unquenchable fire. So he predicted Jesus going into the temple and coming, and that his hope, that his life, his ministry will be separating the wheat from the chaff like it had been happened. So that's why God wanted David to buy the threshing floor, because I want people to know that this is what happens in the temple. God is going to separate the wheat from the chaff. That's what's supposed to happen in the temple. We're supposed to come and either sacrifice and lay on the altar and become licking sacrifices so that God can separate that chaff that is tearing down our lives from the wheat that he's, he's producing. He wants to separate the Ishmael from the Isaac, right? He wants to separate us in the temple. He comes to prove us, to test us so that we can be thoroughly 100% committed to him. So Jesus is going to do that. And those people who do not do that are going to be, suffer judgment and the other, his anointed who he's called will go on to be used by him. So John is predicting what Jesus is ex exactly what he did in the temple. Obviously Jesus's birth was predicted before his name was predicted before he was born. He's number six. Jesus predicted the temple's destruction and he was crucified there in at the temple site in Luke chapter one, verse 30 to 31. Then the angel said to Mary, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor in God. And behold, you will conceive in your room and bring forth the son as you call his name, Jesus. So he's the sixth person who God said in advance what his name was going to be happen. So Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple and he was crucified right outside the temple. The, the last hill of Moriah, perhaps where Isaac was sacrificed, because God said to Abraham, one of these mountains, I'll tell you when you get there. So one mountain is where the sacrifice is done. Because again, the sacrifice is done right outside the temple. Then you go inside the temple and people would bring their sacrifices. So on one hill, the sacrifice was done. And on the next hill, Golgotha, is where Jesus was sacrificed. Okay. Luke chapter 21, verse 5 through 6. It says, Then as some spoke of the temple and how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, Jesus said, These things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So Jesus' prediction that this temple will be thrown down. God built it up for a reason, to, to teach generation after generation after generation that a sacrifice must be done on that hill that will prove them, that will test them, and that will stop the curse. So David stopped the curse by sacrificing on that same hill. And Jesus is saying, and that's why the temple was built, to teach us that there will be a sacrifice that will stop the curse so that the blessings will come, so that the blessing of Abraham will come on you. So Jesus stopped that curse, and he's telling them this temple is going to be thrown down because the ultimate sacrifice will happen. 
and then it won't be necessary anymore. The temple won't be necessary because the final sacrifice will have occurred. And so that's why Jesus is saying this is going to be thrown down. People who think that the temple is going to be rebuilt don't understand the Bible and the God's message. In Hebrews, Jesus, it says that Jesus is the final sacrifice, that we have no more need to go into the temple and daily offer, offer sacrifices because now the lesson has been taught and now we see that this final sacrifice has come. So those are the six people who are connected with the temple who God predicted their birth in advance and, 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 and named them in advance. Who's the seventh person? Ishmael. Ishmael. In Genesis chapter 16, verse 11, it says, and the angel of the Lord said to his wife, his mother, Hagar, <laughs> help me, Jesus, yep. his, his mother, hmm. behold, you are with child, you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael means God hears, because the Lord has heard your affliction. So Ishmael is the seventh one who, and what does you think, what does he have to do with the temple? I see people have built the temple and rebuilt the temple and wor restored worship in the temple. They were sacrificed in the temple. They predicted its destruction of the temple. What does Ishmael have to do with the temple? Well, what is built on top of the temple today? The Dome of the Rock. Ishmael's descendants have built the Dome of the Rock on top of the temple so that another temple will not be built. You'll have to go to war with the entire Arab nation, all of Ishmael, of which are 300 million, in order to get rid of that dome. We don't know, We know, for some reason, don't think that God did that. But God did that. God had Ishmael's descendants build on top of that temple. So as a capper, do not because you don't need the temple any longer the final sacrifice that happened on this hill has already happened and we don't have to go in the temple daily and sacrifice the curse has been stopped but will we receive god's sacrifice will we receive it so that the curse can be stopped in our lives and so that the blessing of abraham which is righteousness it doesn't mean we don't get abraham's money but we get the righteousness because abraham believed god and it was counted to him for righteousness. So that's what we received. Those are the blessings of Abraham. We get God's righteousness. Now we are now we are have right stand God so that so that He can bless us, so that He can prosper us, so that He with health and in whatever ways that God wants to prosper us. We don't get to tell Him prosper me this way, God. But He He wants He has for all of us. He's providing for all of us. But the curse has been stopped if we believe and accept it. So God had Ishmael and his descendants build on top of that <laughs> temple so that the curse, so that we would not be tempted to rebuild there. So we would understand Jesus was the final sacrifice. The first sacrifice was Isaac. And as part of his covenant with Abraham, Jesus was that final sacrifice. So Genesis chapter 22, verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place far off. Ah, oh, there's Moriah. There's Moriah. And I'll talk about what Moriah means next week. So we finally got to Moriah, and we're going to learn why it's important and why God was testing him and why he has those same tests for us. And will we see what God has for us and understand the sacrifice, or will we reject it? And that's what all humanity stands and what was done on that hill. So thank you so much again for listening in. We will get farther in, in Genesis chapter 22. It's one of the most fascinating scriptures uh chapters in genesis and um please stick around if you're especially a member of good shepherd for R renandis grim uh he's doing well and he'll be preaching at 11 o'clock and others of you will will all see monday i mean on wednesday bible study where we're discussing jesus and how he's predicting the the destruction of the temple and what that all means uh so thank you and god bless